morning and happy Easter. Our first song will be He is Lord. Please stand.
Apostles' Creed. Today of all days, these words take on a very special meaning and truth. I believe in God the Father Almighty, maker of heaven and earth, and in Jesus Christ, his only Son, our Lord, who was conceived by the Holy Spirit, born of the Virgin Mary, suffered under Pontius Pilate, was crucified, dead, and buried. The third day he rose from the dead, he ascended into heaven, and sitteth at the right hand of God the Father Almighty. From thence he shall come to judge the quick and the dead. I believe in the Holy Spirit, the Holy Catholic Church, the communion of saints, the forgiveness of sins, the resurrection of the body, and the life everlasting. Amen. Thank you. 
trusted each one of us to be bearers of that light, carriers of your hope and new life to those who are filled with darkness and despair. Oh, holy God, may the joy of this morning and the triumph of the resurrection empower us to live And so it is with one heart and one voice we lift up this prayer your son taught us to pray. As we say, Our Father who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come. Thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our trespasses as we forgive those who trespass against us. Lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, the power, and the glory. life 
even in the midst of the darkest circumstances. And today's news for quite a while has appeared pretty dark, hasn't it? This Easter celebration could not come at a better time. It doesn't matter how many times I read today's passage, my heart always leaps anew. For it reminds me that not only does all of humanity share a corporate Easter story which God offers the whole world, but each one of us also has an individual Easter story unfolding in our lives just like Mary Magdalene. For each one of us has these moments when Jesus calls our name and suddenly everything changes and nothing is ever the same. So join me as we explore today's scripture, which is found in the Gospel of John, chapter 20, verses 1 through 18. But before we start, I, I want to remind us that this is not just a story. Now, it is real life. It's Mary Magdalene's life has just been turned upside down. Now, I dare say, each one of us has experienced times when, out of the blue, our lives have been turned upside down. Isn't that right? So instead of simply reading this scripture, I'd like us to try to place ourselves alongside Mary and the other followers of Christ that first Easter morning. Magdalene woke up on yet a second day to the chilling reality of a world without Jesus. Even now, those words didn't seem real. A world without Jesus? How could she possibly survive without this man? For he had literally transformed her life. No one could have possibly known the torment in which she had lived for years. Yet this man, Jesus, had healed her completely, both body and soul. And it's she who had once lived every single day helpless and hopeless discovered she had a new purpose and a new strength for living. Or at least she did for a while. But now, all of that was gone. Although her eyes slowly opened to greet the new day, not so her heart. Her heart felt as if it was encased in this hopeless, dense fog through which no light could pass and from which there was no escape. Never in a million years could she have ever imagined the events that had unfolded these past few days. Had it only been a week? It, it felt like an eternity. Last Sunday seemed so far away when she too had joined that spontaneous parade, shouting Hosanna and waving palm branches as Jesus entered Jerusalem. Yes, she knew not everyone was happy with the idea that Jesus might be their long-awaited Messiah. And she also knew that not everyone believed in him, as she did, especially the scribes and the Pharisees. But 
still yet, Mary was just as stunned as the others when they came to arrest him in the Garden of Gethsemane. And all of those trumped up charges brought before the high priest Caiaphas in the dark of night, no less. Why, all of their complaints about him were just ludicrous. And even the next day, she was certain that the governor Pontius Pilate saw through their complaints. Uh, surely he would dismiss those charges and set things right. Yet Mary could not believe her ears as those ugly whispers grew. And they became this overwhelming chant. Crucify him! The mob's cry that day grew to a frenzy that even Pilate could not ignore. And then he gave that unbelievable order. Jesus should be put to death by crucifixion. Dear God, how could this be? And today it was as if Jesus' words uttered against that dark sky, Oh, Father, Father, why have you forsaken me? It become her own cry. For now, her heart wept. Where are you? Why have you forsaken me? For Mary knew without him, her new world and her new life was gone as well. But somehow, even now, her heart is still drawn to him. So she gets up while it is still dark outside, and she sets out to his tomb. As she walks with footsteps as heavy as lead, uh, in the far off horizon, pale fingers of light begin to appear, trying to brush away the cobwebs of the night. And yet, Mary knows even the full strength of the dawn will not chase away the shadows found in her heart and soul that day. But as she grows closer to the tomb, suddenly her footsteps falter, uh, scattering stones across the path, and she stares in disbelief. For even in the darkness she can tell the stone has been removed. Mary doesn't know what to think. Her stomach twists in a knot within her, and a cry tears from her lips. Oh, please, somebody help! And Mary begins to run. She runs through the garden gate into the city and up the road that leads to Jerusalem. And she flew up the steps to a familiar house and she beat on its door with a desperate strength she didn't know she had. She pounded again and again, praying that someone inside were to hear. And finally, the door opened at just a small crack and Peter cautiously peered out. And immediately, Mary cried, They have taken the Lord away from his tomb, Peter. He's gone! And we don't know where they have taken him. And at her word, Simon threw open the door, and he grabbed her with his hands, and he demanded, Are you sure? And Mary responds, it was still dark, but yes, I am sure. And then she found herself 
standing there talking to empty air for Simon Peter had already raced down the steps and out into the streets. But then John cried, wait, Peter, I'm coming too, as he flew out of the house and past Mary. But the younger disciple ran so fast, he soon outdistanced Peter and took the lead. And still in a state of shock, Mary followed both men back to the tomb. She caught up to Peter at the garden gate, and when they arrived, they found John kneeling at the entrance, cautiously peering into the tomb. But Peter, being Peter, threw caution to the wind, and he pushed John aside, and he entered. Now the morning's light had grown stronger so Peter could see inside. And sure enough, there was the shroud lying there, but there was no body to be found. Now why in the world would someone take his body and leave the burial cloth behind? And whether he was taken by grave robbers or by government officials, it still made no sense. And the cloth that had covered Jesus' head, it was rolled up and placed neatly to one side. John decided to crawl into the tomb as well. And he too carefully looked around, just like Peter. And slowly, his head began to nod. When both men finally came out of the tomb, they were silent. And Mary begged, Peter? John? What is going on? But the two men walked away Silent, each of them consumed with their own thoughts. Mary watched as they departed. And as they disappeared from view, she had never felt more alone in her entire life. And she began to cry these deep, heart-wrenching sobs and shook her body and soul. And bewildered and still at a loss, she went over to look into the tomb herself. And there, amazingly, she saw two angels in white. And, and they speak to her. They ask, Woman, why are you crying? Mary explains, they have taken away my Lord, and I don't know where he is. But then, in the midst of her turmoil, she senses someone standing behind her. And she turns around, and she's still crying so hard her vision is blurred. And she hears him speak. Woman? It was a clear voice breaking through the roaring of her head and her heart. And he speaks again. He says, Woman, why are you weeping? Who are you looking for? Now, thinking the man was a gardener, she said, Oh, sir. If you have carried him away, tell me where you have laid him, and I will take him myself. And then a soft, familiar voice said, Oh, Mary, Mary. And it, hearing her name, her, her heart leaped, for she immediately recognized that voice. It was Jesus. And she cries out, Rabboni, teacher. And she reaches out her arms to embrace him and gather him close. 
say, Mary, wait. Uh, don't cling to me just now. I, I need you to do something. I haven't yet ascended to my father, so go to my friends and tell them that I am ascending to my father and your father. To my God and your God. Mary departs, but, but this time her heart is on wings as she runs back to Jerusalem. And when she reached the disciples, Mary cries out, I have seen the Lord. Oh, Peter, John, oh, everybody, just listen. He is alive. I have seen him. I heard him call my name. And this is what he said. Beloved, this is the word of God for us, the people of God. And our response is, thanks be to God. Folks, as we read this account of that first Easter morning, it becomes obvious that there is only one thing that makes this whole resurrection event real for Mary. And it's not that the heavy stone has been rolled away. And it's not the empty tomb and the discarded burial cloths. Why, not even the appearance of two angels, which I am sure is not an everyday occurrence in her life. And even these two angels do not make the resurrection real. Now, it was only when Jesus called her name, saying, Mary. No, it was only then that she knew that it was he and that he was really alive. But there was something different about him that day. Yes, it was Jesus. Of that, she was sure. But something has changed. Something that is hard to pinpoint. But whatever it is, that change is so profound that she will not be the only follower who has trouble recognizing. I am convinced that this change, which Mary and the others notice in Jesus, is nothing other than the power of a resurrected life, living and reigning full in Jesus. For now, Jesus is very much alive and very different. And Mary Magdalene is the first person ever to see what a resurrected life looks like. And folks, as amazing as it all sounds, he offers this same resurrected life to you and to me. Folks, Jesus lived and died and rose again. Also, this kind of resurrected living might live in us too. And if Mary thought that her life had changed before, well now she realized that that was just a drop in the bucket. For when the resurrected Jesus calls her name, he offers to share with Mary that same glory-filled life that now reigns full in him. And beloved, that very same thing is true for us as well. And when Jesus calls our name, everything changes. Nothing is ever the same. Because, folks, Jesus promises that resurrection living is like none other. Uh, it changes our lives in ways that we never imagined. Our vision changes. 
changes, our heart changes, our sense of what is possible changes. It completely changes our previous reality. As it changes our past, our present, our future. Because that day at the tomb, I am convinced that Jesus is asking Mary to see herself and her life as he does. For he sees her and knows her more fully than she knows herself. And he wants to free her from everything that might hinder the life that God longs to bring her. morning, Christ wants Mary to see not just his resurrected glory. Now he wants Mary to see herself graced with that same glory that he sees in her. And if Jesus wants Mary to begin to live her real life, her resurrected life, right now. matter is this. The resurrection of Jesus is only part of the Easter story. For if the resurrection of Jesus stops with him, what real purpose does it serve? Now, Easter, Easter in a very real sense, is not about his resurrection, but ours. It is about our resurrected lives to be lived here, now, today. Well, if you think about it, Jesus rarely talked about an afterlife. Now, instead, time and time again, his focus was on what God longed to bring to our lives today. This Easter morning, what is it that you celebrate? Is it just an empty tomb where Jesus once lay? Or instead, do your hearts sing and soar at his offer of living a resurrected life just like his? To which the Easter story is not a once upon a time story cast in the long ago. No, it is a never ending story occurring again and again in my life and yours. And that resurrection comes every time we hear Jesus call our name. Beloved, glory, hallelujah. Christ is risen, and he calls out each of our names. And he longs for this Easter, for our resurrection story. In those times when we share Holy Communion, there is something powerful and real and holy as we come together to do so. But folks, today we are experiencing the risen Lord where even death has no hold upon him. And so I am equally convinced that we do not have to be present here to experience his presence. No, not at all. And so today I invite you to go get something in your house that we might share together as we take 
take communion. Now, if you're like me, I do not keep grape juice and a whole loaf of bread sitting in my house. I just don't do that. But folks, I think the risen Christ is powerful enough to meet us in anything. Can I get an amen? Amen. So I urge you to get whatever you can lay your hands on. It might be a glass of water and a saltine. It might be a glass of orange juice and a piece of toast. It might be Kool-Aid and a goldfish. It doesn't matter. But whatever it is, bring that together now. As we share with one another Christ's holy presence, in his holy communion. Christ our Lord invites to his table all who love him, who earnestly repent of their sin and seek to live in peace with one another. Therefore, let us confess our sin before God and one another. Merciful God, we confess that we have not loved you with our whole heart. We have failed to be an obedient church. We have not done your will. We have broken your law. We have rebelled against your love and have not loved our neighbors. And we have not heard the cry of the needy. Forgive us, we pray. Free us from joyful obedience. Through Jesus Christ our Lord. Amen. Hear the good news. Christ died for us while we were yet sinners. That proves God's love toward us. In the name of Jesus Christ, you are forgiven. In the name of Jesus Christ, you are forgiven. Glory to God. Amen. And now the great thanksgiving. The Lord be with you. And also with you. Lift up your hearts. We lift them up to the Lord. Let us give thanks to the Lord our God. It is right to give our thanks in praise. It is right and a good and joyful thing always and ever to give thanks to you, Almighty God, creator of heaven and earth. And so with all your people on earth and all the company in heaven, we praise your holy name and join their unending hymn. Holy, holy, holy Lord, God of power and might, heaven and earth are full of your glory. Hosanna in the highest. Blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord. Hosanna in the highest. Holy are you, and blessed is your Son, Jesus Christ. By the baptism of his suffering, death, and resurrection, you gave birth to this, your church. You delivered us from slavery to sin and death, and made with us a new covenant by the water and on the Spirit. And then, on the night in which you gave yourself up for us, you took bread, just a common, ordinary loaf of bread, or just a common saltine, or a common piece of toast, or a common goldfish, and you broke it. You gave thanks to God our Father. And then you said, Take, eat. This is my body, which is given for you. That night when the supper was over, you took just a common cup of wine, or it could have been a glass of water, or a glass of orange juice, or a cup of Kool-Aid, and he lifted it up to God your Father, and after giving thanks, he said, Take, drink. This is my blood of the new covenant, poured out for you and for many, for, for the forgiveness of your sins. Whenever you do this, remember. And so, in remembrance of these mighty acts in Jesus Christ, we offer ourselves in praise and thanksgiving as a holy and living sacrifice in union with
with Christ offering for us as we proclaim this mystery of our faith. Christ has died. Christ is risen. Christ will come again. Father God, pour out your Holy Spirit on us gathered here, on us gathered at home, and on these gifts of bread and wine. Make them be for us the body and the blood of Christ, that we may be for the world the body of Christ redeemed by his blood. By your Spirit, make us one with Christ, one with each other, and one in ministry to all the world until Christ comes in final victory and we feast at his heavenly banquet. Through your Son, Jesus Christ, with the Holy Spirit, in your holy church, all honor and glory is yours, Almighty God. Dear ones, Christ promises to all, any time, any place, be drawn near to him. He will be present, bringing new hope and new life, even in the midst of darkness. And for this, and for so much more, all of God's people who are the church, Shout out, Alleluia, Amen. For indeed, He lives. And He lives in me. Why don't you join us as we stand to sing our final hymn today? Glory has.
hallelujah, he lives. And because he does so, so do we.